Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for October 3rd, 2023. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. <clears throat> you can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we're streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by talking about last week's weekly tittle, which was called Pumpkin Spice Season. <laughs> We should mention that there's no actual pumpkin in pumpkin spice season, just the spices. Um, the assignment was to work on the shift from summer to fall. Let's hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who took on our seasonal tittle challenge this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer Ingmari, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, shared this tittle report. I'm finishing knitting a scarf I started last year while listening to you. Good inspiration. Also part of this week's tittle to switch the seasonal clothes. Otherwise, I just have a very minimal wardrobe by choice. The seasonal clothes I take out are coats, hats, mittens, and scarves. I also switch a few dresses from summer to winter. I just have to say, it's it's very rewarding when you complete a project, isn't it? If you're trying to finish knitting up that scarf, it's... It's been sitting around half done and then you spend some time on it and you get to the end and it's beautiful and it reflects all the effort you put into it. Um, it sounds like you're this close to being done with the UFO. So congrats on almost completing it. Um, I will cheer for you in advance. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be wonderful and good job in switching uh, your dresses over your cat, your coats and hats and switching out the dresses. It's good that you are working with um, less rather than more and i'm sure it makes that seasonal change very easy for you so you're a you're a good example to the others <laughs> for <laughs> how, how it could be <laughs> thank you <clears throat> um catherine reports too nice to do things inside so outdoor projects achieved mm, good that's a good thing we've reached the season when we can go outside and survive and on the same theme, Com Connie said, I just did a bit of transplanting some plants. Did the clothes switch last week already? Yay. Good job. Connie's now doing the Samudra trick of anticipating the tittle by a week <laughs> or two. Right. <laughs> doing Samudra, it in advance. Samudra probably changed, switched her clothes around like three weeks ago now. She's probably <laughs> that far ahead of the rest of us. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. Okay, we're gonna we'll come back to that as people have time to respond. But I, we have so much prepared for today. I want to just yeah, like jump that. right into the topic. As we work to reduce the clutter in our spaces, sometimes we find that our relationship to stuff seems hopelessly tangled up in our memories, beliefs, feelings, and so forth. Today, we're going to scrutinize sentimental clutter and offer tips for balancing emotional or sentimental attachment with the real limitations we face in our time, space, and resources. Um, about today's topic, I have to say, I'm sometimes accused of not being sentimental at all. And what? There, <laughs> and th therefore, I don't understand why people struggle with giving up things that uh, um, have a sentimental attachment. I think that people hear me talk about taking action to reduce a collection or to give up some things for which I had memories attached. And because I can do it, they assume that I have no real sentimental feeling about the items. Truly, I believe those people are just misunderstanding what I'm doing and saying. I do feel sentimental about things and sometimes pause and struggle to give up something. The difference for me is that I can just sit with those feelings and then most of the time take action anyway despite them. So you might ask, why is that? <laughs> How can you feel sentimental and still give up stuff? And that's what we're going to talk about today. As you know, I'm a professional organizer by trade, and, and I have the benefit of handling 
many people's whole house full of a lifetime of things. And I'm going to do a little math for you. I did it for myself. <laughs> I have about 450 appointments per year, and that's probably about 200 clients every year since I see many of my clients repeatedly. 16 years in the business translates to 3,200 clients so far. And the average American household has about 300,000 items in it, 300,000. So 300,000 by my 3,200 clients means I've looked at and handled 960 million things, 960 million things to this point in my business. I think I see we could just go ahead and round that and call it a billion. A billion? <laughs> a billion things. A billion things. So I see the same products over and over. I see the same issues over and over. And unlike the average person, I have the benefit of scale. I can look at anything I have personally with a bird's eye view. Anything I'm handling is my one specific little thing compared to the 960 million things I've already handled. It certainly reminds me that it's not so important in the whole scheme of things, even if it was my grandmother's. It's still just one out of millions and millions of others just like it. So I have that scale reference for everything that I touch. I have to say the next way that I can have sentimental feelings about something and still deal with it is because I'm a practical person. As a practical person, I'm not worried about getting rid of unused stuff because from a practical standpoint, if it won't get used by me, I might as well release it to somebody else's use. And I find that assuming that somebody else is going to use it is a way for me to let go. And I'm, describe, I'm going to describe this in more detail. Another way I deal with sentimental stuff is by having trust. <clears throat> I trust that if I put something on the river of stuff, it's going to go on the river of stuff. It will float down the river to the next location or owner or user even if I don't know ultimately who that person is, giving it up to someone you know takes a lot of time and effort. You might be able to see the item being used or you might not. Very few of the items will be used in a fashion that you deem appropriate. <laughs> the next person will not be inside your head and will not be a stand-in for you when handling the items. Most people who want the item to stay in the family assume that a family member will feel the same way that they themselves do, but we have no real control over how the next person feels about any one item. So I choose to trust that the item will end up where it needs to be next and accept that I don't have to know with whom or how it gets there. I trust that if I donate it somewhere, I know that is working to reuse or resell the items, my object will eventually end up in the right place. Frankly, there is no way to know that for sure. And I just choose to think of it as a, a successful result instead of worrying about an unsuccessful result. So my personal attributes allow me to give up things that I feel sentimental about, even if it takes a while before I can do it. I'm sure you all can learn to apply your own strengths and philosophies of thought to this task and release things that you no longer want to be in charge of anymore. A sentimental attachment doesn't preclude handling things in a practical way for your own life. Let's take a look now at some of your survey responses because we received lots of thoughtful responses as always. Your stories covered the emotional gamut from pain, fear, loss, and regret to sweet memories, cherished dreams, and lots of love. Thank you to everybody who answered the survey. We're going to talk about a few of your responses and the lessons that we might be able to take away from them. We asked our audience members to describe an item or collection that you're rationally prepared to release, but something always keeps you from making the final decision to let it go. Then we asked, how do you feel when you think about letting go of the item you described in your answer to the previous question? And as the third part of this three-part question, we asked our viewers and listeners to complete the following statement. I know I won't keep this item forever, so I, I would like blank. Catherine responded, I'm not sure I'm rationally prepared except when I think about decluttering from far away. The minute I touch it, look at it, emotions come up. These are things I inherited from my mother. I've done a good job getting rid of my own things. Catherine says thinking about letting go of this stuff, her mother's stuff, makes her feel 
sadness, grief, guilt, and a desire to go lie down. <laughs> That's familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. She would like to let it go without feeling emotionally crushed. Catherine, you're describing a very familiar point of view for someone who is grieving a loss. Losing a parent is one of the most difficult losses to process in your life. Sadness, grief, and guilt are a lot of heavy emotions to attach to an item. And that tells me that you're not so much attached to the thing as you are reminded that you haven't completed grieving yet. I expect that if you were to put some time into experiencing and processing your grief, maybe with professional or spiritual support, your strong negative emotional response to items from your mother will fade. It's been nine years since my mother died, and I can now handle her things that I've kept with a smile at the memories of her evokes instead of the tears that happened in the first few years. If it hadn't been that long, one or two years since that person has gone, it'll be harder to let go. But after that, and with some proper grief counseling, you can reach a different place about the item. And the emotional responses that you will have around it will shift and change. And I will say that I, I do tell people to wait right after a death. It's too soon right after a death to, unless there, unless there's some practical reason why you have to process all of it right away. I would say, you know, better wait for a little while and get better integrated with how you feel and to get farther along in your grieving process yeah, before you, you start trying to let go of things. Yeah. You don't want to push the stuff away as a, uh, as a stand in for the grief and yes. then realize later that that was maybe not, not, you weren't done with that. You should have, <laughs> yeah, you were not done with that. Exactly. And, Cause, and only to say that when someone is grieving and particularly the loss of a, of a parent or a spouse, um, the grief is very intense and it requires some amount of time to integrate. It's not something that you get over in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> it's a process it's an evolved process over time to integrate that level of loss and so you're in a compromised position to start with and trying to make decisions from that place guarantees that you're going to make bad choices so better to leave it until a little time has gone by and by little i mean a year or two <laughs> and, and then um circle back um there are some people who I will say, um, particularly uh, spouses, like when their spouse dies, then it distresses them to have their spouse's personal items or clothing or shoes or, you know, grooming products still in the house. They find that very triggering and upsetting. But aside from those specific things that are related to the person living in the house with you, um, the rest of the things can probably wait until you're in a better place. Some people don't touch those things and they stay there and they don't want them to move. And some people find like, I don't want to look at the razor and the toothbrush that they used. I need that stuff to go. So that's always a personal, everybody has a different response around that. And you got to honor that in the beginning, but beyond that, adjusting those personal daily items, um, anything else, I think it's better to give yourself a little time window and integrate the grief first, and then you're going to make better decisions. Samudra commented that proper grief counseling is hard to come by. You know, I, you know, this is something you will not hear me do often, but I'm going to make a pitch that involves a church. Oh, okay. Believe it or not. But when, when I um, was, was uh, dealing with grief over the loss of a very close friend a few years ago, I went to a grief counseling group at Unity Church in Houston. Mm. And it was very, it was a wonderful, wonderful facilitator and a really nice group of people and very, very helpful. So I, I think Houston that there's people, something about it. Yeah. Like it's in community that there's, when you're feeling that level of grief, it feels like only other people that are having that same experience understand where you're coming from. And so I'm sure being in that room at unity with all other people that were in that same place gave everybody the feeling of support like all of these people understand where i'm coming from yeah and that is super helpful right yeah it's it's helpful to have the mirrors of other people to you know sh show you what you can't see about yourself you know mm -hmm. i'm depressed you know i'm i'm uh 
or you know whatever your particular grief response is. Um, we have a couple of hands up. Um, I'm going to go ahead, Samudra. If you'll you can go ahead. I'm going to uh, hold off and on the other hands that are up right now. Um, we'll we'll come back to questions later. But since we've been talking about Samudra's response, go ahead, Samudra. I found a grief group. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I found a grief group as soon as I got back to St. Louis after burying my parents and executing the estate. They wouldn't let us talk about spirits or ghosts or God or anything. <laughs> of course, I understand he's in a better place now is kind of rude, you know, because the best place is there by you. But the problem was so many people had seen these signs and seen spirits and had telephone call, coincidental telephone calls from out of nowhere and so forth and so on that I felt like my, I felt like we were being repressed by rationalism that we oh. were being, and, Interesting. Yeah. And, I, and several other people felt that way. And I left and I found, I, I went, I found a lot of the, a local church that I could stand that I actually had ethnic roots in. But and of course, as soon as I got there, the pastor died. My oh old my friend. Goodness. Oh. I mean, we're talking about I, when we come to grief, I'm talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I just right through. Anyhow, but what I did discover was that I mean, I'm not a believer in anything, but I can, you know, especially like that the the opera singer gets up off her bed and sings an aria at the right moment before she dies. But I can suspend my disbelief because I so much love the feeling of community and the communion. And I was baptized in that faith. Uh, but the thing is that I realized that all those signs of the crosses and genuflections and all that, along with the words of the prayers, are a form of cognitive behavioral therapy because that's how they get you to do cognitive behavioral therapy when you're getting therapy for stuff. And if you if you believe, I guess that's good. But if you have the community and you're doing this stuff, it 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 is actually, it works the same way secular people using meditation, it works for secular people using meditation. So it is good. And yeah, I mean, there there's only community, can only be helpful in that situation is our point. Absolutely. Thanks to meter for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, it is, it is definitely, it is definitely a moment in time in your life where other people understanding what you're going through and having a shared experience, however you choose to um, share that experience. Um, it, it helps and it gives you some relief uh, from the idea of, I'm the only one suffering this way. I'm the only one that has this problem. And, uh, and there's, and, and I found when my mother died, it was like, if you hadn't, if your mother was still alive, then you couldn't possibly understand what I felt. And so I needed to be around people who had also lost their mother to have that conversation about the depth of loss that I felt and how uncomfortable, how unpleasant I found it. And, if you hadn't had that experience it was like, well, you can, you know, be in, you can be understanding and empathic to me, but you really don't get it yet. <laughs> so I, it was very important for me to be around other people who are grieving that level of loss as well. And, and I found that super supportive. And, and what we're saying here is grief impacts your ability to process stuff and to make good decisions about letting go of objects and, so dealing with the grief is part of getting you to the place where you can let go of it and, um, and, and make ra practical, rational decisions about, I want this object for my mother in my house. I don't want that object in, in my house. And so <clears throat> if the ultimate goal is to face the things that you have sentiment about, um, one of the things that you have to deal with is your level of grief and where you are in that, in that journey and make sure that you are supported around that um, and have some level of integration before, before you try to make a whole lot of very big decisions about what's staying and what's going. That's our point here. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. Audience member C, just the initial C. 
says clothes one to two size smaller than I wear now are the problem item. These are classic well-made items, so timeless fashion-wise. If I let these go, it means giving up on myself and efforts to fit back into them. Regarding the feelings involved, C says, it's partly the sunk cost, but also the maintained hope that I still might fit into the beautiful clothes again. They don't tease me. Mostly, they are there as a challenge reminder. Not too many, but enough to make efforts worthwhile. C says she would like to let, let it go to someone who will appreciate it. And there is a lot tangled up in that presentation you just gave um, in what you wrote. I think that the first thing I'm going to say is you can give up the beautiful clothes now so that someone can wear them now that actually fits into them. And that is a separate thing from your desire to get into a different size to fit into beautiful clothes, what you think of as beautiful clothes again, even if it's not those clothes, those specific clothes, you can still have that goal for yourself. You can still, you don't, giving up those clothes doesn't actually have to mean giving up on yourself and your efforts to fit back into them. You can still maintain that effort. You can still come from that place of, I want to shift and change my body type. It's not, a, it's not an unreasonable goal and it doesn't have anything to do with those clothes in particular. I see how you have linked them together in your mind, but I'm saying, I want you to remember that it's really two different things. Practically speaking, there's clothes hanging in the closet that are timeless and fashionable and would be well-worn by somebody who can actually get into them right now. And the longer they sit in your closet, the more they deteriorate, the, the less, um, Less value they the less value carry. that they have and yeah. and they're you know the elastic is dying and the you know the, the colors are fading and whatever. So better that you from a practical standpoint, better that you pass those specific items on to someone else and let them use them. Somebody that needs the nice clothes to wear for work, let them have them. And in the meantime, you can be pursuing your goal of not you know not giving up on yourself you can be supporting yourself and working to fit into a size that you feel more comfortable about and you can then have new clothes when you have reached the size that you're comfortable with so i'm i'm trying to suggest that you can unhook those two things and keep in mind that the, that goal that you have for your your body can be a project regardless of whether you have those clothes or not and and if you want to keep you know if there's 10 of them and you want to keep one as an inspiration because you said they sort of act as a challenge reminder. So keep one or two and release the bulk of them. And that will still make room in your closet. And about the sunk cost part of it, I would say, think of the sunk cost as you're basically going to gift to somebody that can't afford these clothes. Otherwise you're going to gift them the purchase of those clothing. It's like you're you're giving somebody a gift down the road. You're going to support another woman who needs those clothes and can't afford to buy them up front. You will have bought them on her behalf and you're just sending that gift down to her. And I'm sure she'll be very appreciative when she can buy it much less expensively as she would otherwise. So think of it as a gift to someone else to address the sunk cost thought. Keep the goal of improving yourself because it's clearly a goal that is important to you if you don't feel comfortable you want to move towards a different target great and be practical about the clothes being in the closet not being used and letting them be passed to somebody else there i think i covered everything you said <laughs> i think you did okay, okay. Let, let's go on Den, let's go on to denise denise okay. said, <clears throat> denise's issue is some christmas decor that her grandmother knitted she mm. says, I'm now 66 and my grandmother died when I was 38. I don't like the items that much and don't put them out. I rationalize keeping them because they all fit in a gallon Ziploc. I know that my son will just throw them away if I do not. I do not have any expectations that he should keep them. My grandmother was the original minimalist and she would have no expectation that I should keep them. 
I tell myself that someone will throw them away and it might as well be me, but thus far I haven't been able to. She admits that she should just, just put them in the trash and, since they will end up there sooner or later. What do you think about that? <laughs> and you're at the perfect time to release those items to a school or a church or a senior center to add to their decorations collection. There's no need to assume that it should go straight to the trash. Um, you've already stated it's been decades since your grandmother died. It's not your kind of stuff. Nobody has any expectation that it st should stay. Okay, great. It's one Ziploc bag. Go and donate to somebody that, um, you know, decorates in on a large scale, which is why I said a school, a senior center, a church, um, where they're putting out a whole bunch of decorations in all kinds of places for the season. And, you know, you can add them to that collection. You don't have to just assume that because you don't like it, it might as well go in the trash. <laughs> and maybe you'll feel less. I'm, I'm hearing that you feel like they should be thrown away, but you can't quite let yourself do it. And I'm guessing that you feel some responsibility to your grandmother for it because your grandmother did it. She handled it. She made them herself. And so if you can uh, pass them on to someone, then A, you're not throwing them away and B, someone else can enjoy the handmade work that she did. And if they throw it in the trash, um, you can just assume they're going to use them. And if they decide that they don't work and they can donate them away or throw them in the trash and you will never know. So I say, pass them on, <laughs> pass them on to somebody else and let them work with them in their Christmas decor. Well, and you know, not, this is not to suggest that this is what's going on with Denise, but just to, to make a little broader point that it's only one Ziploc is, is dangerous it's a dangerous way to look at it for some people. I'm not, I'm like I said, I'm not saying that's necessarily true for Denise, but there right. are plenty of people who say, well, that's just, well, it's, this is just one more little box of this. And here's just one more little container of that. And eventually you've got your spare room overflowing with little tiny quantities of things that are just a little bit more. Right. right. The, the one more thing to keep. Exactly. The one more thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that her, as I'm reading the comment, her instinct is to let it go. And she's telling herself, my grandmother wouldn't want me to keep it. My son doesn't want to keep it. I don't like it. Like she's telling herself all the reasons why it's okay to let it go. And then she's not letting it go. And so I think she's hesitating because it was her grandmother's handwork to translate that into trash, even though she's telling herself it should be trash. And I'm saying skip that process completely, donate it away to somebody that will use it, that can that can possibly use it. Not that they guarantee that they'll use it, but they can possibly use it. You can add it to somebody's collection. And then, you know, you're released from the, you don't have to be the one to throw it away or throw away your grandmother's handwork. And you can put it in a, in a situation where it can possibly be used again. And that I think will alleviate some of your guilt about I should, everybody understands and nobody wants, and I should just trash. And um, I don't think you have to go that far. I think you can just donate it away and let that be the way that you let go of it. Linda suggested I would set up those ornaments to create a pretty photo, maybe with a photo of your grandmother in the shot, then send them on their way. The photo, mm. the photo will honor her and might comfort you. And honor her and her handwork, right? Her, it was yeah. her, it's her own handmade craft. So yeah, yeah that's a great idea um, to put those two together. So you have a little bit of a memory about them, but then you have one little picture instead of the Ziploc of the pieces that you don't want to use and would never put out. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead to Dorothy and Dorothy's white whale is an expensive brand new chemistry lab set that I'm no longer interested in using. She says that when she thinks about getting rid of it, I want to cry. I, I meant to perform experiments on YouTube as a teaching experience for students to prove that I was a good teacher. And also I thought it would be fun for me as well. I've since retired from teaching and now I've got other interests, but it was so expensive. Hmm. She wants to sell the set. And she also says, my daughter suggested that, suggested that I could sell the big kit and get a much more basic, more doable kit if I still want to pursue the experiments. 
and this is a this is a perfect example of, of the sunk costs concept, right? Like you bought the expensive chemistry set and you were going to do some things for students, but now you're retired. So the purpose of having the set to begin with has sort of uh, fled. And so uh, it's rolled along. Your life has rolled along its, its path and you're not in, in that position anymore. This I think this is another way that you can think of you spent the money and you can gift it or sell it to another teacher who is younger and still in the game in the middle of her career instead of at the end of her career and uh, his or her career and let those people have that object that they probably wouldn't have the budget for otherwise. I'm sure you know a lot of teachers and you probably know a chemistry teacher <laughs> and you probably know somebody who is um, doing that kind of work in front of a classroom and you can send that stuff on and let them use the objects without either you can gift you can gift it to them and be in support of their career development um meaning that you spent the money and now you're giving it as a gift to another teacher or you can sell it for something less probably than you bought it and again selling it for less means that you make it available to teachers that probably can't afford it yet if they're young enough to be um buying the kit now to use in a classroom it's not a, it's not a far stretch to suggest that they're struggling with their own school's budgets and cash flow and may not have the resources to handle it and so if they're buying it from you at less than full price then you're sort of gifting them access to this object that they wouldn't be able to afford otherwise and so if you so i see that your daughter has made this suggestion that you can get a more basic kit and I'm just about that one. I'm wondering, um, do you still want to do experiments online? Is it something that you, uh, as a retired teacher, do you still want to post up videos for other people to use? Are you like trying to make material for other teachers to use? Like what would be the goal of buying the basic set? And we would have to have another conversation about that. Yeah, but yeah. In the meantime, I, I think you can you can make a choice around this kit that doesn't, that isn't linked to, the next kit you're going to buy, <laughs> you can just make a decision about who can use this chemistry lab materials and tap into your own network of teachers and find somebody that wouldn't have the school budget to handle it and let them have it or let them pay you half of what you paid for it. I also, Something, think, you know. I also thought that it was interesting that Dorothy said, um, I meant to perform experiments on YouTube as a teaching experience for students and to prove that I was a good teacher. That's interesting to me because I think we, we hear lots of examples of people who, you know, the thing come, a, the, a thing can come to represent some part of our identity. We get, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the tangle there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm sure you were a good teacher and you don't have anything to prove, <laughs> And at this point, because you're a retired teacher, the proof is in the pudding, right? The proof is in a lifetime of uh, of teaching. You you didn't get out of the industry. Lots of people start to teach and then they realize, oh, this isn't for me and they run. And so if you spent your lifetime being a teacher, I think that by definition means that you were a good teacher because you were able to hang in there and keep doing it and trying to generate external validation at this point isn't really necessary. I mean, I think you've lived the fact that you were a good teacher and you have that whole career to look back on and go, that's how I contributed to students over my lifetime. That's how I helped um, students learn and grow and become better people because I was in the classroom teaching them. And, and that's a super valuable thing and, and something you can be extremely proud of. And so I wouldn't tr tie the chemistry set to the proof that you were a good teacher. I think you can lift that. You can unhook those things and you can look at a whole lifetime of teaching as the proof that you were good. And in the meantime, here's this chemistry set that you need to do something about, right? <laughs> like separate those two things from each other. And if demonstrating chemistry experiments on YouTube is going to be fun for you and, and you feel like it creates a value for for kids who are still in school, do it. But why you know, not do it, do it because it it's important to you and fun. 
And because you can, and because you would, you know, be you'd be good at it if you thought if that was entertaining to you. Yeah. I mean, Ed and I sit here and talk about organizing stuff all day long. I'm not <laughs> getting paid to do this. This is just fun, <laughs> and we like to talk about it. And we're, you know, this many years down the road, and we've still been talking about this stuff. We started out talking about this stuff 16 years ago in a coffee shop, and we're now we're doing it on YouTube. And it's it's if you think that it's fun and we- you want to tap into your expertise around that. That's a whole different ball of wax than what do I do with this expensive chemistry set too. We would still be doing it in a coffee shop, except we couldn't fit all of you in the coffee shop. (laughs) True that. (laughs) Okay. Pat reports that her problem item is a bread maker. Uh, She she feels first a mixture of fear. We might need it someday. And then the positive side, it was a much needed gift, brand new, very expensive, and a so very lovely gift from my husband. She would like to let it go to anyone who can get use, get good use of it, but says she doesn't know how. Okay, so what's your take? <laughs> there's a couple of things here. There is no scenario in the universe that I can think of, Mr. Cook, you'll have to chime in here, that a bread maker it is something to be afraid of not having. <laughs> there is no scenario where you will not will have to break make bread in a bread maker instead of go to a store somewhere and get bread. Like, I'm not sure what the fear is there. You might need to make your own bread. No, you won't. There there will be bread made somewhere forever. It will not be a problem. That's like the most basic thing. And people were making bread without bread makers for many thousands of years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the process of bread making is not so sophisticated that it can't be done without a machine. So if you have to make your own bread, um, you, you can probably work it out even if you've let go of the bread maker. Is the point? Now that being said, I do love a bread maker because <laughs> I I did my time. You're not helping, man. <laughs> I, I, did, I did my time. I needed a lot of bread with these hands, right? Before there were bread, <laughs> before there were bread machines, and I do enjoy the bread machine right it's also a quicker way to make you know to to knock out a loaf of bread if you're if you're too busy to do the whole process yourself right but but yeah so don't be be afraid (laughs) don't be afraid that you'll be without bread the second thing i will say is um i also hear it's new it was a gift it was expensive and it came from your husband so there is that Um, There is that layer of, I want to honor the gift that came from my husband. I want to respect that he spent the money and got such a lovely gift for me. And isn't that great? And I think this is where you have that conversation about, you've gotten a lot of gifts from your husband over the, the course of your marriage. And sometimes they are a hit and sometimes they are a miss. And if bread making didn't turn out to be something that you that caught on for you, that held your interest, um, that became the fun project that maybe he thought it would be for you. He took a shot and it didn't quite stick and that's okay. And you can still be grateful to him and you can still be thankful, say thank you to him and appreciate that he bought it for you. And that is a separate, that's a separate interaction with him from okay and he gave it to me and now i'm not using it and it should somebody else can use it like it didn't turn out to be my thing it's no different than trying a new craft and deciding that you don't like how it works or you don't like the process of i don't like painting or i don't like knitting i thought i would love knitting but i don't and so there's no point in keeping the tools of the craft that no longer holds your interest or didn't turn out to be as much fun as you thought and so He took a shot. He gave it to you on the off chance that maybe you'd love to have the bread maker and think it was fun and it didn't turn out to be true. And so it's okay. And, you know, bless it and kiss it and send (laughs) it on and, you know, kiss your husband and tell him, thanks for buying it for me. I appreciate the, I appreciate the attempt. And you can separate those two things and he's going to give you more stuff later. (laughs) So it'll be okay. (laughs) There'll be more presents coming. <clears throat> okay, let's go to Lisa Beth's story. Her trouble spot is 
some of mom's collectibles that my dad felt someone should want. My mom was a hoarder and dad loved her and would do anything to bring her a smile. I'm the only living daughter. This stuff makes, makes me feel tearful. The feelings move through me like a roller coaster. I know that I only want positives around me. She'd like to offer it to extended family. Uh, she says all of us kids have more than enough for sharing with our kids. She says she would like to pass the rest on to someone it will make smile. So I, I hear the desire to take mom's hoard and have it be meaningful by enriching someone else. And you've given the exception, except all of your extended family has plenty of stuff to give to the kids. Like there isn't anybody in your family that needs that volume of stuff from your mother. <clears throat> the hoard is not necessary anywhere in the extended family because all of you guys have your own stuff and you have plenty of things to gift away to your kids. So at this point, having the desire that all of the stuff in your mother's hoard become something that is loved by someone else is a really high expectation just because of volume. I mean, if you're using, I'm assuming because you're using the term hoard, she was a hoarder that you're talking about a large volume of stuff. Well, except she does say some of my mom's collectibles that dad, that my dad felt someone should want. So dad mm -hmm. has already curated it to some extent. He's talking about a specific slice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Even so, if it's not something that, I mean, the mom collected it because she had an interest or a compulsion. And in that moment, indulging her compulsion to add things, to collect things, was her dealing with her um, hoarding syndrome, with her uh, need to acquire. But the people that are on the receiving end now are not coming from that same place. They're not needing to acquire things to trigger the to to be in there i don't know how to say this properly they're not having that same experience of i need to collect i need to collect like the mom did and so they made the mom smile in the moment because she got to add to her collection but not everybody that possibly could receive it is going to have that same response about it and it's so a, yeah it's a, it's a tall order it's, it's the the desire to pass it on to someone it will make smile is basically finding somebody who wants to collect them in the same way that mom did and and i think that's asking a lot of the family member so i think this is one of those things where you have to take the collection and you have to pass it on to a resale shop for instance i mean if they're collectibles then Go find a church resale shop that has a, you know, we we take the items in as a donation. We put them to resell to support our church, our programs, whatever their whatever their stated purpose is. And if three months goes by, then they donate it on to Goodwill or whatever. And so you can give it a potential life by putting it in a resale situation where you're not particularly going to get money back from it. I'm thinking of the guild shop in Houston where you make the donation to the church of the objects um, at the end, but you can, you can put them in and spend three months trying to make money off of them and they track them. And then at the end of three months, it goes into the donation pile and you don't get anything off of it anymore. So <clears throat> you can put them in that situation where, and I'm saying that not because you'll make money off of it, but because the resale store is designed for people to come shopping at. And so they have a targeted audience of people that are going to come and look at the stuff. And if they see one of the collectibles that makes them smile, they can purchase it and take it home. And so you want to put those collectibles in front of an audience in a, in a volume audience, right? Like your extended family is a much smaller group than the customers that run through a store on a monthly basis. And so send those on to a store of some kind, some kind of resale situation. And they have a built-in baked in audience of people that shoppers that come by looking. And that gives you the, the high possibility that some of them will go home with somebody. And in the end, if they don't, then you've certainly given it a good shot. If you, if it spends three months in a store, 
uh, with constant customers going by it and it still doesn't get picked up, then you can say that you've made a good, a valiant attempt to get it in somebody's hands and it can go on and be donated somewhere else. And so I think, um, I think that's the best way to address the extended family doesn't have space for it, doesn't have the mental space, doesn't have the physical space for these collections. And we still want someone to collect them and love them like mom did. Uh, I think that's how you get rid of them. I think you send them on to a resale store. Let's go to an anonymous, an anonymous respondent shared having trouble with inherited old pictures that are interesting and seem historical, but names, dates, and locations are unknown. The respondent says, discarding the items make me feel, makes me feel guilty and relieved at the same time, and that I don't know anyone who wants the pictures. Right. So if you don't have a family historian, if wherever you are in your um, your family, extended family life path, uh, there's not anybody else around that wants to collect them, then I think the fact that they have no names and no dates and no locations identifiable, that, that means that you can't like gift them to a historical side because they're not identifiable. So then they become, depending on how old they are and historical they are, um, then they can become craft supplies, art supplies for people that are doing artwork using old photographs. So you can make an attempt to donate them if you wish, or you can just say, okay, they have lived their useful purpose. They have been, in, they've served their useful life. And now it's time to recycle them, send them on. And I imagine there's a spectrum of items that you have. And some of them are super, super old. And some of them are not so old. And some of them are old black and white. And some of them are more color. Like you can tell how the picture presents, sort of where it is along the camera spectrum spectrum over uh, the evolution of photography. And so you can make some choices about the stuff that's super old and maybe find a place to donate them for use. And the ones that are... <clears throat> Less current, I mean, uh, more current can be ones that you just go, sorry, don't know who you are, bless it, kiss it, put them in recycle. I know it's, it's, it does feel it's like you're throwing away people, but you're not, you're just throwing away paper. You're throwing away paper with some images on it. So <laughs> try not to tell yourself you're uh, doing something bad because you're really not. Okay. I think we have time for one more of these stories before we um, get to... Our last question, which we want to also talk about for a moment. <clears throat> Leah's problem area is supplies for raising chickens. I like this one. She reports mixed feelings about getting rid of the supplies. I'm sad because I miss my chickens and want more. My dog ate my last four hens. They were seven years old and still laying eggs. But realistically, I will not have chickens until my dog passes away, which will likely be many years from now. And I would be, would be better off starting with fresh equipment and supplies then. Gathering new supplies would be nice and fun, but my nagging brain says it's wasteful to throw out what I have, what I have now just to get shiny new things in the future. But on the other hand, she wants for the stuff to get good use before it gets old, brittle, rusty, etc. That's exactly right. You want to send them on before they become old and brittle and useless, right? There's no point in saving them um, and having them die before your dog passes away, if they're going to just be there with you and then slowly deteriorate into useful, into uselessness before your dog passes away, there's no point in keeping them. Right. So um, I am sure that you can go on um, Facebook marketplace, your neighborhood, um, you know, next door app, you can go on to free cycle and say, you can go on to Facebook. Hey, I, Got supplies for raising chickens. Who's raising chickens out there that want some free supplies? Somebody will raise their hand and you can send them on. Urban and let somebody and, that urban has and suburban chickens have become very fashionable too. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm sure that there's somebody out there who is could be using these things right now. And so that they won't go to waste and they'll get used before they die, before they are, you know, destroyed. And in the meantime, you can wait patiently until your little dog. Uh, goes to God <laughs> and then have, you know, then start out with new chickens and new stuff. And <clears throat> I think, especially because you think that it's going to be several years before you're in this situation again, 
um, the the supplies that you have right now are not going to be in good shape when you get to that point. And so finding another person that's raising chickens is your best bet. Let's rate, let's find that person and send it on. Maybe you get some eggs back in exchange. Right? Yeah, there you go. You'd say, hey, you don't have to pay me. You just have to give me, you know, some eggs for a little while. All right. For this week's Just for Fun survey question, we ask our audience to fill in the blank on this statement. Watching and listening to the Clutter Fairy Weekly makes me want to try blank. <laughs> and a lot of audience members chose one of the examples we offered Watching and listening to Clutter Fairy Weekly makes me want to try living with less. Good for you. Yeah. Um, why don't you give us some of the other, our other favorite answers? Paula says, I would like to try to reduce my stuff even more. That's an excellent goal. Maureen replied, I would like to not leave all this stuff for my kids to sort out one day and or in lieu to hire and fly Gail to my town for advice. Love to do that. <laughs> that would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Diana would like to try thinning the herd. Go, Diana, go. We love it when people try to thin the herd. <clears throat> uh, Bina says she would like to try to get rid of more stuff. Plus, the latest episode makes me think about taking up a new craft. <laughs> there were, uh, you know, fixing you by craft remote control. There were a few of those. I think right? they're going to be, I think they're going to be at least three new beaters in the Oh, there you the go. Clutter community. Okay, we yeah. can have a clutter furry sub subunit for beating. <laughs> An anonymous respondent wants to try to finally manage paperwork with ease. And she would also like to give you both a big hug. Oh, thank you. Thank we would you. love to have that hug. Thank you. Uh, Selena says, I would like to try to give myself a break mentally, not literally, <laughs> and forgive uh, for my past clutter related mistakes. You both are so compassionate and so are the viewers. That's very true. Our audience is very uh, supportive of everybody along that organizing journey and their great support for each other, uh, which I can always tell because the chat, the chat always goes mad and <laughs> it's not always about what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I know they're in there talking to each other about what's going on and that's super awesome. And, and any kind of clutter related mistakes, like there is no reason to not forgive yourself immediately about that. Like whatever, that's water under the bridge. And we are here to just take you where you are and let you move forward. And so let us um, honor you and in your goal to forgive yourself for past clutter related mistakes. And I have to say, and in related to clutter, is there really like, is there really any need to be judgmental about it? No, there is just absolutely no reason to give yourself a hard time. Whatever you've done is what you've done. And wherever you are is where you are. And and it's just not worth flogging yourself over. <laughs> There's just no reason to be upset about it. So we're just going to keep moving forward. And whatever windy road you took to get to where you are and wherever windy road you're going to go to get the stuff out of your house later whatever it's all a windy road and you're still on it and so that's all we care about and you're going to do fine and we want to support you in forgiving yourselves about any kind of judgment you have about it let it go let it go let it go this is where i sing the let it go let it go song <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> it is every organizer's theme song right <laughs> okay we must be just about out of time if gail yes. is singing so <laughs> let's talk about next week we're going to be back next week tuesday october 10th at the usual time mm. we're going to talk about sharing responsibility for stuff who's invested who's in who's out and so on join us on october 10th for yours mine ours sharing or delegating responsibility for clutter there you go how about a tittle this week's tittle is called holding on tightly or letting go lightly. This week's assignment is to ponder your relationship with an object to which you feel a sentimental, nostalgic, or other type of emotional connection. First, you want to identify an item that you've been thinking about releasing back into the wild, but about which you haven't been able to reach a decision yet. Reflect on any feelings, memories, experiences, or emotions that the object invokes for you and try to answer the following questions. Are your reactions to this object largely positive, negative, or mixed? Do you own other items that invoke the same memories or same emotional responses or that remind you of the same person or period or experience? So is this object that we're talking about one of many things that 
cover the same person? Is this item the best representative of its kind that you possess? How does this one compare to the category in general? Do you display the item or keep it in storage? Would you display it if you had a sufficient suitable space to display it? Now consider whether you're any more or less ready to let this item move on out of your life. If you still feel stuck, make a note on your calendar to return to this exercise after allowing a week or two to pass and see if you haven't um, experienced any shift in uh, thought about it. Give us a give it a try and come back and give us a report. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To receive notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from our audience, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Yes, you can. You can always um, support us by going to Patreon. I'm going to throw the Patreon sign up. Oh, thank you. We haven't done that in a while. <laughs> you support us by com slash Patreon. Slash Patreon. You can support us in uh, doing this work for fun. And we appreciate that you come every week and help us have somebody to talk to about it. So we're not just talking about it in a vacuum. <laughs> or a coffee so, shop. Or a coffee shop. Exactly. One, one more quick us. One yes. more quick note, um, because there were a couple questions in the chat about it today, um, about taking the survey later after the show. You can, oh, yeah. You can definitely do that S starting, I forget, a few months ago when we transitioned from ha posting the surveys on <laughs> Google Drive to having them on our own website. Um, since they've been on our own website, we're keeping them online. So you can take those indefinitely, and we keep monitoring the responses because we get, still get new interesting answers on uh, future topics and the ask us anything question and so forth. So and feedback all the time. Yeah. Check it out. To take this week's survey, you can go to cfhou.com slash survey 184. To go back and fill the answers in again. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. We appreciate it. And we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.